let's look at some of the gaps we have to bridge. And the next two, the, the, the first two we're going to look at is we're going to look at uh, the political gap, if you will, or uh, how governmental kind of ideas or international or civil kind of thoughts that go along with that, and religion. And uh, when you're covering religious cultural gaps, it's a vast, 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 tremendous uh, realm. But what we're going to do is we're just going to look at a few things uh, from the scriptures that show us it, to understand them better by having some of the background and cultural gaps bridged, we'll be able to understand better what's going on. Now, some of these are very significant and some of these are insignificant, if you will. It's not going to really change the world, but some of them, as insignificant as they are, are actually details that are going to help us have even more confidence in our scriptures, which is actually the first one we're going to look at. And this is in your notes. Uh, this is Daniel uh, 5, 7. And let me, let me just read this and we'll just go through real quickly some of the impact. Uh, the king called aloud to bring the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to his wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple, have a necklace of gold around his neck, and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. Now, this is Belshazzar, you know, with the handwriting on the wall uh, type of a, a, an idea or that's where this text comes from. But some people, people go, well, why in the world did he offer the third ruler? Now, the purple, the necklace, and all those other things have particular cultural meanings. But why did he say the, you're, you're going to be third ruler in the kingdom? It's kind of weird because usually it's second in the kingdom, you know, like with Joseph. You know, you, you are going to be second to me as Pharaoh. You're going to run things. The reason is, is if we go back and we look in the culture and we look at the governmental structures back then, we find that Belshazzar actually was not first in the kingdom. He was second in the kingdom to his father, Nabonidus, who happened to be, uh, from historical records, he had leprosy and was, I think, is it the a, uh, oasis city of Tema, I think it was. And so Belshazzar was second in the kingdom. So all he could offer was third in the kingdom. And so from that perspective, this, this might seem like an error, but it actually gives us an understanding of the political stuff that's going on and helps us realize that this was not written later by somebody who did not understand what was really happening. This gives us clarity that whoever wrote this down, Daniel, <laughs> knew exactly what was going on. And he knew this guy was second in the kingdom and why he said he would grant third in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of a gap there, but it gives us more confidence that this was written by a very knowledgeable person, mm -hmm. not somebody later on. And a lot of scholars, you know, try to say, oh, this wasn't written because look at all the prophetic language and things like that in there. Here's just a little hint that helps us see that. Um, in Ruth, chapter 4, verse 1, uh, it says, Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat there, and behold, and, clo uh, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by, and he said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down there. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit here. So they sat down. And so why in the world did Boaz stop at the city gate? Well, why doesn't he go out under a tree or a field or in a house out of the sun? Why would he do that? Well, we realize that the elders of the city would sit at the gate out in public and resolve matters and issues uh, that had to be done. So Boaz goes there for the redemption of Naomi's land. And that's where business was, was done. And you see this in Deuteronomy and Joshua and Job and other places. So again, a little teeny cultural background helps us understand this was the official rendering by the leaders of the area. This was kind of going before the court and saying, yes, this land has been redeemed. Yes, this has been transferred. And that's why the elders were so important and why it was relevant for them to be here and to conduct business. So those are just two little political, civil, governmental type of ideas that we have to look at. So let's look next at some of the religious ideas. So here again, there's a couple of examples. Um, Exodus 23, 19. You shall bring the choice first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord, of the Lord your God. 
you are not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother. And this is also found in Exodus uh, 34, 26 and Deuteronomy 14, 21. So why in the world? I mean, it seems kind of strange. Why in this little innocuous statement did, did the Lord tell Moses not to boil the young goat in the milk of its mother? I mean, that's just like, huh? Why in the world? <laughs> I, don't I don't get that. Well, we find in some other ancient Ugaritic, uh, or where Ugarit is in modern-day Lebanon, writings that this was part of a Canaanite ritual. And so when God says this, he's basically saying, you guys are going to be going into the land of Canaan. And I don't want any hint of this Canaanite ritual in anything you do. I don't want anybody to say, oh, well, they're just Canaanites. Oh, they're just picking up a Canaanite thing. Or they're going to worship the Canaanite gods or any of the other kinds of things. And so Israel was going to go there. Then no pagan practice whatsoever, even such a trivial, silly thing as that. Now, from a pagan uh, perspective, there, there's reasons for that. And Josephus in the first century makes an uh, implication that to cook, the, the, the milk is what gives life to the animal. And to cook the animal in the thing that gives life in its death would be improper uh, pagan kind of idea, sort of commingling life and death. One well, of the pagan rituals, that would be actually probably a good thing. Okay, we're going to give life with this thing that's dying, which will give us life or, you know, whatever kind of thing. But again, a simple thing like that with that culture, that religious background is God wanted to make sure there was absolute purity and absolute separation from him and any other deity. That was a Canaanite ritual. Kind of interesting. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but the ten plagues in Exodus chapters uh, 7 through 12. If you look at those, and we have, have in the notes here um, some of the, the plagues of the gods of Egypt, and this is from the Bible Knowledge Commentary, so you can see that in your notes. These plagues, and scholars you know, debate on certain ones of them, but basically these were the various gods they were over the various elements or ideas in the, the religion of Egypt. And ultimately, we see that God said, who's going to be the strongest God? Is it going to be the God of Israel, of Moses? Or is it the God of Pharaoh in Egypt, or the gods of Pharaoh in Egypt? And that's really what the ten plagues were about, showing God's power. And that's why any time the conjurers could do the same thing, people say, ah, see, our gods are just as powerful. Ah, see, our gods are just as powerful. See, our gods are just as powerful. Well, the, the idea of the, the Nile turning to blood would be you know, just a direct attack on, well, what happened to the Nile goddess and gods that protected the life source of Egypt? Well, they couldn't do it because Moses' God could turn it and they couldn't stop it. Okay, that's planting a little seeds of doubt in there. Um, the seventh plague, hail destroyed by the crops, shows that the goddess of the sky, Nut, um, and the god of fertility, or uh, Osiris, uh, and the god of storm, Set, could not stop hail and protect the crops. So your storm god, your rain god, your, your fertility god, your crop god, your sky god, God said, watch, boom, hail from the sky, you can't stop it. Crushing your crops, you can't stop it. My god is the god who is in charge. And finally, the tenth plague, as an example, the firstborn of Egypt uh, die. And this shows that that leading goddess, Isis, who was the protector of children, was powerless. And also, if you, if you think about it, when you, when you look back at the Egyptian pharaoh, was considered basically semi-divine. And so if this semi-divine human representative pharaoh of the gods could not protect and care for, and his gods not protect his son who dies, you have the semi-divine leader and can't even protect his own son. What kind of leader and what kind of power and what kind of gods do you have? I mean, this, this whole thing was just, I'm in charge, you're not. My God is more powerful than yours, you're not. And again, in those cultures, that spoke 
volumes. It wasn't just, oh, can we figure out how frogs and plagues and flies and as we try to rationalize it. That was not the message of this. There was a massive theological message that's going on. These were not just historic events and, oh, wow, isn't that cool? Okay, it's just a miracle. It is an indictment on the God of Israel is powerful beyond all the gods of Egypt. So when Moses said, God says, let my people go, he meant it. And he's going to demonstrate who's really in charge of this world. And in, again, in this uh, handout here, you'll see some of the other plagues and some of the other gods and some of the other deities that are affected by that.